what's up everyone, Matt here. Welcome back to my workshop. As promised in my last video, today we're gonna to be working on this dirt bug mini bike. I acquired this bike in 2006, bought it from Canadian Tire for $299 Canadian. It was brand new, uh, just threw it in the back of my car and at the time I owned a condo unit and uh, in back there was a huge field and I wanted something to just rip around. You know, I was kind of in the suburbs, didn't have a lot of open space to have any type of motorcycle or dirt bike, but this thing was just perfect, wouldn't really bother the neighbors or the entourage. And I had numerous hours of fun. When I say numerous hours, probably about five or six cumulative hours over the span of about two years. Uh, this bike has virtually no runtime on it. Now, it went into storage and for several years, it was just kind of forgotten. And about two years ago, my uncle asked me uh, to fix up a mini bike because he was doing a snowmobile show in the summer. He wanted to have something to ride around the grounds. So I had this thing stored away in a hidden uh, container unit. And luckily it was just on the side of the doors when I opened it. Uh, I had to move a couple things out of the way and I pulled it out and there it was, still in pristine condition, but it hadn't ran in about 10 years. So you might be asking yourself, what's the big deal? I mean, 10 years in storage shouldn't wreak havoc on most mechanical devices. But did I mention that this is not a brand name mini bike? It's called a dirt bug, but I have no idea which company manufactured it. It did come out of China, so we'll call it a Chinese mini bike. Now, when I dived into certain systems, they didn't fare very well over time, namely the fuel system. Anything that had a rubber component basically dried out and turned all gummy, which is not something that I'm used to seeing because I try to stay away from these Chinese products because I don't like the reliability over time. One positive note, however, is that I try to stay away from buying knockoff products to put on brand name things. Like I won't buy a reproduction carburetor to put on a Honda because I just don't feel like it's gonna hold up well over time. I'd rather rebuild the original one and if possible with original parts. But this thing being a Chinese mini bike allowed me to go on eBay and do something that I've never really done before. Buy actual Chinese parts for real cheap to get this thing running again. And I can't say that my wallet did not enjoy that experience. So take this carburetor for example. This is not the original carburetor. This one is. Like I mentioned, everything that was made out of rubber that fuel ended up touching over time turned to this grimy gel. This thing smells absolutely terrible. I knew that I wasn't going to be able to rebuild this thing without having a carb kit. So I went online to find a carb kit and what did I find instead? A whole bunch of cheap, brand new carburetors. I mean, the identical ones that went on this bike. And I think I paid under $20 for this one. It actually showed up fully assembled, an intake gasket, an air filter gasket, and two of these fuel filters. I installed it and surprisingly, without even touching any of the jets, first pull, this thing started right up. The second thing I noticed was that this fuel tank did have some rust and deposits at the bottom of it. And this bike did not originally have a fuel filter. Now, there was a small rubber line that would go from here to there um, and very little room to put any type of filter. So what I did after cleaning this tank out, I ended up putting this transparent snowmobile fuel line, loop-de-looped it to give myself some room to get this filter on. And I ended up using some wire twist it off to kind of keep everything nice and snug. And it's been doing a good job keeping whatever was remaining in this tank, even after cleaning it, there was a little bit of residue. Well, it's been filtering it out pretty well because this carb was not taken apart since and the bike's been running pretty well. One funny note is that this low end loop over here is acting a bit like a sediment bowl because there is some sediment that's accumulating in there over time. Now, one of the worst affected parts of the fuel system was this gas cap. Well, not actually this one. This one's the replacement that I put on. This is the original gas cap. It's made out of plastic. And if you can see, this gasket was definitely not a fuel grade or gasoline resistant gasket when they, when they manufactured it. Even this metal over here really badly corroded. The tank wasn't this bad, but this cap was definitely 
a cheap, cheap piece of garbage. I had an old Honda GX uh, gas tank, and this is a this is a this is the cap off of that. If you notice, I mean, it's by no means perfect, but you know, for the age of it, this is probably a 20 or 25 year old Honda gas cap. You have some mild cracking, but it's still soft enough to retain its uh, pliability and not have any fuel leaks. We can see some of the old gasket that's still crusted onto here. It literally melted on. That fuel tank, I'm not sure if we can see the inside of it. Yeah, that fuel tank is not too bad, but there are little rust spots. Um, but like I said, that fuel filter should do a good job catching all that. I know that so far it has been. So once that tank was cleaned out and the carb was changed, this thing was back up to running as good as new. But then I remembered something. Just like back in 2006, this thing had a hard time dragging me around. I mean, it is a kid's mini bike. The maximum weight limit on the sticker is 150 pounds, and I'm about 30 pounds above that weight limit. The tag on the engine says it all, 97 cc's, that's probably not even three horsepower. And although it can get me up to top speed just fine, taking off on anything but a nice flat asphalt surface is very, very difficult on the engine. We're talking taking off in grass, we're talking taking off in dirt or mud, forget about it. This thing definitely needs a good push to get me going. So this is a little bit of a weird video. Uh, I ended up shooting a bunch of stuff when I pulled this thing out of storage two years ago. And today I'm reshooting uh, some scenes in order to try to get a story, make this kind of flow a bit. But if you notice that certain things are kind of put in there that don't make any sense in this timeline, just know that this is a mix of videos from two years ago and stuff that I'm doing right now. So when you look at this mini bike, this is the, the most basic entry level type of mini bike. Uh, it does have a clutch, but it's a centrifugal clutch directly hooked up to the engine clutch sprocket. And when the engine hits a certain speed, it engages and directly drives the sprocket in the back. So it is a direct drive type of transmission uh, that does have a clutch, but there's no gears, there's no variable uh, clutch movement that'll change the speed. The only thing that changes your speed is the engine speed. Now, I wanted to keep this thing as original as possible. One thing I could do to get more power in order to drive me around a little easier would be to change the engine. Uh, and that's probably one of the most easiest things to do that'll give you better top speed, better torque, better everything. Get a five horsepower, get a six and a half horsepower. Now they're going with CCs, a 212cc uh, engine or whatever they call them now. I'm used to horsepower stuff, but anyways, put that on, get it done with, and you'll have a much better mini bike, at least for an adult. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to put a different type of clutch. I want to keep this thing as stock as possible. So what I decided to go with was change the rear sprocket in order to get more torque. And automatically in a system like this, by changing the ratio to get more torque, you have to sacrifice top speed. But in my case, I figured something out that made it that I didn't have to sacrifice anything. Let me explain that to you. So if you wanna know how I'm able to get more torque out of this bike without sacrificing top speed, we have to understand first how this carburetor works. When I twist the twist throttle on it, you can see this linkage activating the carbs uh, butterfly valve. And this linkage up here is basically an extension arm off the governor. Let me show you. We have the governor over here, which is basically a shaft coming out of the motor. And there's a mechanism in there that as the motor hits a certain speed, in our case, uh, technically it'd be 3,600 RPM it would end up pulling the throttle back. So even if I give it full throttle, this is full throttle, this governor can still come and pull that throttle lever back. So this is me activating the throttle with the twist grip, and then this is the governor pulling it back momentarily, slowing down the engine. Once it reaches a speed below the 3600, it'll allow it to open back up, and it does that repeatedly. That's basically how it governs the top speed of this motor. We see we have the twist throttle cable coming down over here. And again, when I give it full throttle, it pulls this lever back 
activating by a spring this, um, this governor linkage and giving it its full throttle. Now, if you want to increase or decrease this top speed of the bike, there's an adjustment screw back here, right over here, that this basically butts up against. So if you want to go any faster, you can unscrew with the screwdriver here, a Phillips head. We unscrew it, and if you notice, I'll go full throttle, and here we're going further and further back, allowing, so here's the maximum, so it won't go any further than this, but this would allow it to go as fast as this motor can turn, that's what it would allow it to do. Now, when this bike was brand new out of the box, it wasn't adjusted to full throttle, and I don't want it to be adjusted to full throttle. I'd like to keep this motor for a long time, and I determined it was probably cutting out around 25 or 2800 RPM, and we can uh, validate that mathematically. So in order to figure out how fast the engine is spinning at a given speed, we first have to find out how fast the rear wheel of the mini bike is spinning. In order to solve for the rear wheels RPM, we have to know the diameter and we have to know the speed at which the bike is moving. The diameter is easy. You take a tape measure and you measure the overall height of the wheel. In our case, 14.3 inches. In order to measure the speed that the wheel is moving forward, I ended up downloading an app and putting it on the bike, running it at full speed, and I ended up finding out that it was running 16 miles per hour, as you can see here. Now that we know two out of our three variables, we can go ahead and solve for wheel RPM. This long equation over here is nothing more than a way to convert inches into miles, minutes into hours, basically so we can input a wheel diameter in inches, a speed in miles per hour, and in order to get a result in revolutions per minute. It's simplified over here. The RPM of the rear wheel is equal to the speed of the bike, divided by 0 0.003 times the diameter of the wheel in inches. We go ahead and input our values, and that ends up giving us a wheel speed of 372 RPM. Not the engine speed, the wheel speed. In order to solve for the RPM of the motor, we end up dividing the number of teeth at the rear wheel divided by the number of teeth at the motor multiplied by the RPM of the rear wheel. We plug in those values and we end up getting an RPM of the motor of 2,370. Now that's not very fast and it also means that we can go ahead and crank up the speed of this motor in order to get more top speed. So now we know that with the 70 tooth rear sprocket, the stock sprocket, 16 miles an hour, the engine spinning 2,370. When I screwed the screw fully out and measured the speed with my cell phone, I ended up getting a calculation of 3,887 RPM, which is 287 RPM above the maximum speed limit of that motor. So I would not recommend running at that speed. Uh, your engine probably wouldn't last very long, but you know, you can do it. You can get this thing running 26 miles an hour if you want. <laughs> So basically that's the trick. Um, if you were to buy one of these bikes and right out of the box you wanted it to go faster, you could make sure that this screw is completely uh, unscrewed to the point where uh, it doesn't affect the travel of this linkage. Um, if you wanted, for example, to limit the speed of the bike, let's say for a kit or something, you could go ahead and twist it so that you get less and less movement. Your engine would be allowed to go uh, to a lower engine RPM, you know, you would limit it maybe down to 2,500 RPM or even 2,000 RPM if you don't want to go too fast. Uh, keep in mind that I think the idle on these motors is probably about 1,000 and the clutch probably kicks in and I'm going to say 1,500. Uh, that's just a guess, but you know, you can't go, you can't go too much lower than that, but you can play with the speed quite a bit. One really strange thing to notice is that this spring over here basically allows the throttle to come back 
Well, they didn't, I guess, have a proper space to uh, connect it. And what they did was they ended up just looping it onto this muffler, uh, I guess, heat guard. So that's how it actually was. I mean, but you would kind of consider this to be almost like a shortcut or like a, you know, they just said, I don't know how we're going to do this. And they said, oh, we can just clip it onto there. That'll be cheap and easy. So I always find it funny when you find these things that they just sort of decided at the factory to make, you know, the most half-assed approach to doing something and they decided to go with it. So in order to explain what I want to do to this bike, let's quickly take uh, this chain guard and this clutch guard cover off. So here we have the clutch section, um, centrifugal clutch directly hooked up to the motor. There's no speeds. It really just spins the speed that the engine is spinning once it's engaged. This is an 11 tooth sprocket. It drives this rear 70 tooth sprocket and it has this tensioner that keeps the chain tensioned up even though right now it's not. I'll show you guys how to adjust that. Um, but what I want to do today is uh, remove this 70 tooth sprocket and go ahead and put a larger sprocket. Now, let's check and see. I know we don't like math, but we'll do a little bit of math. I'll check and see what it's going to take to get a little bit more power, considering that I can't go too much larger because this is only a 14 uh, or 14 and a half inch diameter tire. So we can go a little bit bigger. I assume we can probably go about half an inch uh, larger on the radius, one total inch bigger in diameter. And we'll see what that gives us in terms of torque increase. So we're back to this page over here. I added some more data for the 80 tooth rear sprocket. We use the same calculations as before, 16 miles per hour. Now the engine has to spin 2,733. That's no problem. That's well below the 3,600 RPM limit. If we were to run it at 3,600, we would theoretically be able to get 21 miles an hour. And if we were to push it, to the extreme limit that we saw before, we'd be able to get 22.5 miles an hour instead of 26. That's a 15% reduction in speed. However, we do gain 15% more torque and that's what we want. So as we've seen by putting an 80 tooth sprocket, we can go ahead and gain almost 15% uh, more torque. And like I mentioned before, normally we would lose top speed but in our case, we'll be able to readjust the engine speed, bring it up from, uh, what, 2,800 to about 3,200 and retain our maximum speed of 16 miles an hour. This is the rear sprocket we'll be putting on, and we're going to cut to a video of how to do that. So when I would ride this thing, and even when it was brand new, it would kind of howl, howl along. And I'm noticing that this bearing is uh, kind of not very good. And let's see, and the other one is, huh, completely seized. No, almost seized. And uh, has it been riding on the pin? No, the pin's doing okay. But uh, yeah, so we'll probably try to We'll try to get some new bearings on it, if we have time. We get some new bearings and uh, that won't be too much of a luxury, quite frankly. This guy will just come right out. So here is the sprocket. And here is the new one. So as you can see, it is quite a bit bigger. So it's actually probably more like an inch and a half bigger. And uh, if I look at it, you know, that's gonna be big, but it'll fit. The good news is the way this guy's made is it looks like it's just punched. So I could probably cut, cause I don't have a lathe or anything here. I could probably cut this thing off here and just knock this out. 
and then I should be, you know, if the hole is a little bit bigger, which it will be, uh-uh, here's a problem. Trying to fit this new sprocket on there might be a little harder than I thought because I thought that, I don't know, I thought that the, uh, that the bolt circle for these guys would actually fit on the sprocket. And one of the hard things about finding an 80 tooth number 35 sprocket was a lot of them had a large center bore. This one only had a one inch bore. And from the picture, I assumed that it had maybe a, um, like a two inch. Now this looks like it's about two inches here. And I thought that I had over two inches on my flange or my bolt circle or whatever my pattern but if you look at this hmm, let's see over here kind of kind of seems like i'm gonna be lining right up with the inside of this guy here let's put on this right here like this let me see i'm kind of half half and half but by being half and half, that means that the hole on the bigger sprocket is probably bigger than my bolt circle. So it wouldn't be that big of an issue if I had a bit more time, but this bike's gotta be ready in like a day or two to go to that snowmobile show. So yeah, I'll tell you what, what we're gonna do is we're gonna knock this guy off. I'm gonna flip this guy over, I'm gonna get my grinder, I'm gonna grind this off over here and see if I can bang it out and then we'll see if we're lucky, this might have a lip. I don't think so, but uh, oh, it might have a lip and this guy could be bigger, but I don't think so. We might be real lucky, but we'll figure something out. All right, I'm gonna grind that guy off. So the foul smell of temporary defeat is upon me. Um, yeah, I grinded this guy off thinking that I could just bang it out and uh, it's a little bit more solid than I was hoping for. And that might be a good thing because I'm thinking about it and I'm saying, well, you know, my bolt pattern um, would have to go close to this line where that insert goes through. And I'm thinking to myself, if I end up machining off this and uh, well, either I can weld, maybe I could just do a little bit of weld over here and then again face it. But that's gonna require using a lathe, and ladies and gentlemen, I don't have one here, so I'm gonna have to go get my hands on someone that can, someone that can machine that for me. But uh, yeah, we'll call it a temporary defeat. Doesn't look like I'm gonna be able to do this tonight. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll get that done, and uh, we'll check back in because I mean it should be a straightforward job. I mean, as soon as I got the right hole on it, and I drill some holes, that should be done. So. Uh, We'll call it a night for today and uh, I'll tune back in once I have this sprocket sorted out. Okay, so we're back. Um, it's been two days since, uh, since the last little clip. And uh, yeah, the project came to a, to a staggering halt when I found out that the, uh, the sprocket that I ordered uh, was not gonna be as easy as I thought to, uh, to get on this bike. But uh, luckily, uh, I was able to go see one of my buddies that had a uh, lathe. I was hoping I could get away with not having to use a lathe. But uh, yeah, so the original sprocket, as you recall, had a hub on it, one inch bore. And uh, I initially thought that this sprocket was gonna be uh, a 50 millimeter um, bore in the center and then the bolt circle was at 60. Turns out it's actually like a 37 uh, millimeter um, bore and I think the bolt circle is like at 50. So that ended up coming right into the uh, right into the hub of the sprocket. So we had to face that off and uh, drill new holes. So that's done, painted, ready to go. So I'm happy about that. I also picked up some uh, bearings 6201 uh, bearings and I uh, I got this rod ready that I'm going to use to to try to persuade the bearings into the uh, into the hub because as you recall uh, maybe from sitting for so long because I mean this bike only has probably about you know four or five kilometers of wear on it I mean I really didn't use it that much but uh, yeah these bearings are, are are completely are completely shot 
and they might be, we're going to take that seal off and check and see if there's any uh, corrosion in it. But uh, anyway, so should be pretty easy from now forward, uh, going forward. So uh, that's it. Let's get back to work. Okay, so I got the wheel set up in a little vise that's sitting on the ground and uh, I cut this piece of, uh, of shaft. Uh, now when you have two bearings that are pressed in on either end, um, you kind of, I mean, if you have a puller, you can get in there and just yank it out. That's the best, but uh, I don't have one of those. So uh, I just use this method here, knock on it a bit and get the first one out. There we go. So, oh, it looks like it had a sleeve inside there. So yeah, there's a sleeve in there. Great. So this bearing's out. Like I said, it's a 6201 uh, Chinese bearing. And uh, I ended up buying brand name SKF bearings instead. Cause I kinda, I don't know. I kinda didn't feel like putting a Chinese bearing on it for no specific reason. So that's good. So we got the first one out and the next one, we should be able to just kind of bang it out a little easier. I'm gonna set this guy up a little better and we'll bang the second one out. All right, so we got that tire right down onto the floor and uh, because there's some, uh, there's a little bit of height caused by these Allen uh, head bolts, we should be able to get it out that way. Same technique, folks. Same gentle persuasion. And are we out? Almost. Just like this. And that's it. All right, so we'll get these oil seals off here. We'll check and see. Yeah, so there's a little bit of rust, just a little bit. I think that's probably from sitting, I mean, because there's still, there's still grease in them. You know, they're not as bad as when they were in. Maybe just by moving them around a bit or let's see this one here. One of them will seem like it was worse. Hmm, nice and greasy. They're not as bad, but they, they seem to go on, they seem to spin rough. Yeah. Anyways, we're gonna put some new bearings on it. That's not gonna be too much of a luxury. We can handle it, we can handle it. So, in order to get these, uh, these new bearings on, uh, because I don't have a press here right now, uh, and I don't like banging in bearings if I don't absolutely have to. Uh, what I do is I cut this piece of threaded rod, and uh, I got some nice big heavy-duty washers that uh, basically fit on well onto the well onto the threaded rod, and then the bearings. If we look at this over here. They come up nice and tight, and look at that presses on the outer uh, race of the bearing and it's gonna glide it right in. We'll get both of them in at the same time. How does that sound? So we'll just put that on like this and we'll do the same thing. We'll, let's not forget our, our trusty spacer. And then get another bearing on there. And this. And as long as I line them up, and you know what? Let's do the other person who's gonna take this apart of me a favor and get the numbers on the outside so that they know what side. So we're good on both sides, okay. And we'll put some washers on this one too. And we'll get a nut on there. And as long as they're lined up, properly lined up to start with. So if you look at that, properly lined up, I'm gonna make sure that you guys are seeing this properly. I can't really see what I'm doing here, but look at that. So nice and lined up there nice and lined up over here. And now basically all we have to do is um, tighten, tighten those nuts and if everything works according to my plan, it should press those bearings. Oh yeah, look at that, look at that go. You gotta see this, this is a, this is a satisfying, this is one of the most satisfying parts of my job right here. Guiding a, guiding a bearing into its, into its new home, look at that. Going in all nice. There we go. And it should butt up once those washers hit the. Uh, how's the other one going in? You see that? 
once the washers butt up against the uh, the flange, you know that you're all the way in. Nice and tight there. Mm, there we go. We'll take that off and look at that. We didn't put any damaging force on those bearings. They're nicely seated. Let's see how that feels. Perfect, perfect. Good. All right, so before we do the, uh, the front bearings, we're gonna, we'll finish up the rear. Um, you know, let's get this guy on. So sprocket, as you can see, fits perfectly in. And uh, yeah, we'll just get these little Allen screws back on there. We'll be ready to go in no time, folks. Last one. And we're good. That's it, folks. From a 70 to an 80 tooth sprocket. All right, let's get this wheel back on. So I think we said the large, the large shim was on the brake side and the uh, small one was on the sprocket side. So get that, get our bolt, our bolt's ready to go. see how nice and true this guy spins. Looks pretty good. And that's it, so new bearings, new sprocket. How's the clearance on it? I'm just gonna make sure that tire stays inflated. Kinda hard to see with the black on black, but uh, like I said, let's just make sure that that tire stays inflated. So because we increase the size of our rear sprocket, we require a longer chain. Um, instead of putting two links on the original one and having a piece of old and a piece of new, I decided to splurge, you know, the, the $20 or whatever it costs to get a new chain. Okay. Come on, there we go, perfect. You guys remember what direction to put the um, link pin or snap, uh, snap thing? Always have it in the direction with the opening pointing away from the direction that your chain is turning. That way if ever it was to snag on something, if it was this way and it was to snag on a twig or something, bing, it could pop it out. If we're gonna err on the side of safety and get this guy on the proper way. There we go. Perfect. So with the chain now on, um, even at full tension, um, I still find this a little bit loose and 
with the uh, additional stretch that's most probably gonna occur. I'm not gonna have any more adjustment. So we're gonna have to move this engine. We're gonna touch these, uh, these four bolts underneath and we're gonna move the engine forward, have the tensioner at the minimum setting and have an adequate tension at that point. And that, that way I'll have my full tension stroke uh, for future requirements. Let's get that engine forward. Okay, so with the four bolts uh, loosened underneath the chain tensioner at the minimum, we're going to pull the engine forward and re-tighten up our bolts. We don't want to go too tight um, on these bolts because they're very small. I think they're, the socket is a 10 millimeter, so that's why I'm only using this quarter inch drive ratchet just so I can get a bit of wrist action on it. And now we can see that by moving the tensioner forward slightly, you know, we barely have any more adjustment back. That chain is nice and tight. So I can tighten up this little jam nut or adjustment nut and then retighten the bolt. And then our chain is going to be perfect. And we still have some slot left to move this tensioner back as this chain, uh, slackens over time. Perfect. Let's go get some gas in it and take it out for a little spin. All right, so we're out here in the wilderness and because it's a dirt bug, I have to find a bit of dirt, not mud, dirt. So let's take the sucker out for its maiden voyage with the high torque sprocket.
So the bike's running great, as you can see, and I dialed in the speed to 16 miles an hour full out by adjusting that little screw. Check it out. There you have it folks a whole lot of work for not a whole lot of gain but we had fun this is the dirt bug mini bike hope you enjoyed this stay tuned for the next one signing out